Thank you. Well, last week was a great time when we had our United service with our four campuses all together. And Pastor John brought a great message which really summed up the vision of Springfield Christian Family. And if you weren't able to be there last week, I really encourage you to get onto the church website, listen to the podcast. Uh, We all need to hear that and probably need to hear it again. On the screen, uh, first up, you're going to see a list of the values of our church and where our preaching series is going for the rest of this year. There are five key values that we've identified the Lord leading Springfield Christian family in and we're going to preach a series of about six to eight weeks on each one of those values throughout the year. The first one is the uh, the power of family and that equates to our value of family. The second one is service values and we're calling that one love in 3D. Then we'll move on to our mission values, and we're calling that get out. (laughs) Our team values, and that's about all in, and teamwork that makes the dream work. And finally, our discipleship values, and we're calling that series the X Factor, because that's about multiplication in the kingdom of God. So we're in for an amazing year, and I believe it's an amazing strengthening year that God is sowing into each one of us, and collectively as a church. Uh, Very clearly, the Lord impressed on me from the start of this year. He said, prepare, prepare, prepare for growth. So what we're doing, when we want to grow, we have to put the foundations in nice and strong so that it can actually carry the growth that God sends. Well, we are a multi-campus church with one vision. And today, I'd like to address why we hold this important value. Uh, The message on the power of one is relevant to us as individuals. It's relevant to us in our marriages. It's relevant to us in our families as a campus and then across our four campuses as a church. There is great power when we become one. One with God. One with each other. Great power is made available. I'd like us to read Ephesians 4, and we're going to read from verse 1 to 16. It's going to be on three slides consecutively on the screen, so you will be able to follow there. I want to give you some background, first of all, and that is how Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesian church. Ephesus is modern-day Turkey, and quite interestingly, in about a couple of weeks, I'll be in Turkey, which was Ephesus back at that time. And... uh, It was a major trade center. It was built on a port and all the major roads intersected through Ephesus, which made it, um, I guess, the big commercial hub. Now, Paul's goal in writing this letter isn't a rebuke. You know, so many of the letters where you did the wrong thing. To the Ephesians, he's not writing to rebuke them. He is writing to expand their vision. It's so easy for our vision to shrink down to just our day-to-day life. Paul wanted to expand the vision of his readers so that they could better understand the magnitude of what God was wanting to achieve through them, the magnitude of God's purposes, the magnitude of God's grace and what he wanted to do. And he wanted them to appreciate God's goals for his church. We can so easily settle into our goals for what we think the church should be. But what are God's goals for his church? So let's read through that lens, Paul writing to the Ephesians. Now he's in prison when he writes this. I imagine that when you're in prison, your letters would be reasonably serious. They wouldn't be flippant letters, would they? As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and in all. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ." 
Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. For from him the whole body joined together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up as each part does its work. There are three things I'd like to talk about this morning. The power of one, the origin of one, and what it is to have Jesus as the center of our lives. First of all, the power of one. Like many couples here, um, when John and I married 32 years ago, we were quite different to each other. I was um, very outgoing and talkative, and John was more reserved and serious. You're probably wondering what's changed in 32 years. (laughs) Uh, Well, John liked glass and metal and black furniture, and I liked um, natural woods and timbers and earthy colours. So it was a really good thing when we got married that we were quite poor and we couldn't afford any furniture. (laughs) And we just had to rent a a furnished flat, and that just took that question out. Well, a part of our marriage vows, and it was interesting, Maury mentioned this when we were praying out on the side before the service. Part of the marriage vows include this. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they will no longer be two, but they will become one. And John and I were pretty sure what we knew becoming one flesh was. But we weren't so sure on what it was going to take to become one. 32 years and struggles at times to learn what it is to lay ourselves down and become one with each other in every area of our lives. And when we sort of started to get that down pat, then we decided to have babies. So then we had to learn what it was to, as a family, become one when there were babies and we had to learn to lay ourselves down in new ways when children became a part of our family. And then some years down the track, we got involved with a new church plant in Springfield (laughs) and we joined with other families and we had to learn again how to lay ourselves down so that we could become one with other families, so that we could become one as a church. And then we were part of a church that decided that it would plant new campuses out so then we had to learn how to become one and are still in that process of becoming one church under God one priority one set of goals that God has set for us in Philippians 2 verse 1 to 5 it says this the words are on the screen therefore if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ If any comfort from his love, if any sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. This is Paul speaking. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others in your relationships with one another. Have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And here is Paul, and now he's teaching the Philippian church what being united with Jesus looks like. We get the impression that if he had to write this letter to the Philippians about what being one with Jesus looked like, that they were maybe struggling in this area of being one with Jesus and what it should look like. It didn't seem to come naturally, and maybe it doesn't come naturally for us, to be one in mind, in heart, one in spirit, to be one in purpose with Jesus and with other believers in the family of God is a mark of maturity. And it forges the church into a force that the Bible tells us the gates of hell will not prevail against when the body of Christ is as one together. The very first church 
we read about in Acts 2. And there's a list of things, but I just want to pull out two verses here. Acts 4 verse 32. Because it describes what this very first church was like. And it says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. And verse 47b, and it says, and the Lord added to their number daily. Well, we would all like to see SCF being added to daily. And in the years we've been a part of it, there has been much adding. What started with three families is now four campuses and some 450 people. The Lord has been adding, but to to see this happening daily. Do you know, every morning the inbox of my email is filled with all these emails from Christian organizations. And it's another program, another way to do church better, another way to solve your church problems, 10 keys to fixing your church, um, five ways to be a more dynamic preacher, six ways um, to discover the problems in your church. The last one I looked at, 15 trouble signs in your church. Do you know what? If I read every one of those emails every morning, I'd be depressed before I even got going for that day. Everyone's got a solution on how we should do things better and how we can stir up the gifts better. And and well, goodness me, if we just had more healings going on, surely that would bring the people to the church. Or if we just had a better building, our own building, our own air-conditioned building, would not that be wonderful? Surely that's what's going to make the church grow. And if we had the right brand and the right promotion, surely that's going to make people come. Surely would that not add to our number daily? Well, let's have a look and see what happened in that first church in Acts chapter 2. What was the secret of the early church's growth? Why was its number added to daily? And I've just got, I'm not reading it all, I've just got it up on the screen, a summation. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to breaking bread. They devoted themselves to prayer. All the believers were together. The believers shared everything. They met in the temple. They met in each other's homes. They had glad and sincere hearts and they praised God together. There's the secret of a church that gets added to on a daily basis. There was a whole lot of community. If you look at the word community, com meaning come together in unity. That's what was happening in that church on a daily basis. This church community had one heart, had one mind, had one spirit and had one purpose. They were not trying to do church. They were just being the church. God loved them. And they loved one another. And the use of the spiritual gifts flowed out of the love God had for them and the love they had for each other. See, because when I love God and when I love you, there's a flow. (laughs) And the spiritual gifts just flow. You actually don't have to crank it up. (laughs) There is a flow. A flow of the grace of God. A flow of the healing of God. A flow of the love of God. When I'm one with God, then I can be one with others. If we had the opportunity, if we knew we were dying, just like Bruce's mum knows that her time is near and Brenda's mum knows her time is near, what sort of prayers do you think Brenda's mum and Bruce's mum are praying? They would not be frivolous, flippant prayers. And I don't think they're actually asking for more stuff. If we knew on the night before we were dying and our salvation was sure, we would be praying for those who don't know him yet. I think that would be the only topic on on the agenda other than welcome me, Lord Jesus. But I would be listing the people who I know who've been a part of my life who are not yet part of Jesus Christ yet. And I would be petitioning him for them. That's what I'd be praying about. Well, Jesus... His prayer is recorded in John 17. It's a wonderful prayer. The words, uh, verse 20 to 23. It's much longer than that, but I've just taken three verses. And these are Jesus' words on the night before he dies. And he says this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, 
Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity and then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Firstly, Jesus prays that his disciples would be one, as he and the Father are one. Numerous times the disciples uh, displayed a spirit of division (laughs) and criticism and arguing when we read Jesus' interactions. And Jesus always brought correction, always brought them back to what their purpose was, his love for them and their love for one another. And next in this prayer, Jesus says, I pray for all those who are yet to believe. So what it means is on the night before Jesus died, he prayed for you and he prayed for me. He prayed for all those who were yet to come and be a part of his family. Jesus prayed down the generations for all believers. Prays that all of us would be one. Just as he and the Father were one, he prays that we would be one with the Father, we would be one with him and we would be one with one another. So... Why the power of one? Why do we talk about this? Verse 21 of that, John 17. So that the world would believe. So that the world would believe you sent me. And verse 23b. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. When we are of one mind, one heart, one spirit and one purpose... As the church, we represent the fullness of God. We represent the fullness of Jesus, the Spirit and the Father. And people are watching. They are looking on. And they will be drawn to that love. They will be drawn to that oneness. They will be drawn to a place where they can belong and be drawn to a place where they can be safe. They will be drawn to a place where they can really see Jesus and the Father. The ultimate reason and the purpose of unity is for the glory of God. Being one mind, one heart, one spirit, one purpose proves to the world the unity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is real. That Jesus really is who he says he is. When everyone spoke the same language, and John mentioned this last week, when everyone spoke the same language at the Tower of Babel, even God said nothing was impossible for them. And They were doing the wrong thing, so God confused their languages and caused division so that they couldn't continue that tower. But the reverse is true. If we are all speaking the one language, if we are all singing the same songs, if we're all meditating on the same word of God, there is nothing that the church cannot do in this time, in this place. I just heard, I think it was at at my graduation, In Rome, it was the perfect time for Jesus to come because all roads led to Rome (laughs) and it was the time when the message of the gospel could get out. We are now in an age of the superhighway. There are roads everywhere on the internet to every nation, to every tribe, to every tongue. The time for the church to rise up is now. The time for us to speak his word, his truth, to represent him, to be one in mind, in heart, in spirit and purpose is now. The news is being seen everywhere. We, we, we're seeing what's happening in Egypt <laughs> with the Egypt team on Facebook. Ta-da! There's a little video. There's Manny feeding one of the babies in the orphanage. Hello. We can see what's going on in this world. Okay. Just imagine if each person and if each campus of SCF were all aligned one in mind, one in heart, one in spirit, one in purpose. What impact would we have on Springfield? There's an illustration I want to use, and it's one you've probably seen and heard numerous times, but I just think God gave this, and we need to have it embedded on our hearts and minds. And it's uh, the image of geese flying in formation. It's an amazing scientific fact. Do you know that the goose's eyes are on the sides of its head, which gives it really good all-around vision. But when your eyes are on the side of your head, what's your front vision like? (laughs) 
and what's your back vision like? You can't actually see very well directly in front or directly behind. Hence, the geese have to fly in this arrow formation so that as they're flying with the side, out of the sides of their eyes, they can see the bird ahead and they can see the bird behind. If their eyes were in front, they wouldn't be able to. And also, if they, if they were directly behind, they'd have to tilt their head and that would throw off their aerodynamics with their flying. It's just amazing, God's creation. 25 geese flying together in formation can cover 70% more distance and at a 70% increased speed than birds that fly by themselves. They function more efficiently as a group working together. Now, if the geese fly in formation and it's, um, each one is just slightly on the uplift of the next bird, apparently the, at the wingtips, there's a, a spiral of air that leaves the wingtips as they're flapping that creates the lift for the next bird behind. Hence, they don't have to <laughs> flap as hard. They actually get to do a lot more gliding when they're flying in formation and get that extra lift. Less flapping, more gliding. They also take turns to be the leader bird. The leader bird doesn't, isn't the one the whole time. As soon as that leader bird gets tired, he or she drops back into formation and the next bird takes the leadership position. So they have shared leadership. The communication and the coordination of the group, that V-shape actually assists them because they can see where each other is and they can hear where each other is and they can honk at each other. Their communication is improved. And that works for the safety of all the birds that are flying in formation. They know if one starts to drop out of formation. The geese honk from behind. So the lead geese doesn't honk, but the ones behind, um, they honk. And they're honking encouragement. Come on, kid, keep it going. Keep the speed up. We can do it. Come on, let's get there. That's what the honking's all about. It's just amazing. Actually, when we were in India, there's a lot of honking on horns. And, you know, in Australia, it's like you only get honked at if you do something wrong. But in India, you just get honked at. Here I am. I'm here. Make way. Make way. And that's why there's so much honking. It's much like the geese. They're just, come on, move forward, move forward. Keep the speed up. They encourage each other. Now, when a goose falls out of formation, for whatever reason, I'm a bit jacked off. Fancy following that bird all the way. How far does he think he can take us? Do you know what happens when the bird falls out of formation? He loses the updraft. He starts to experience drag and resistance. And so he can't go as fast. So he very quickly will hop back into formation because that's actually where he can travel the easier, get more gliding and less flapping. Now, if uh, a goose is sick or wounded of the ones flying in formation, they get wounded by being shot. It's sport. Um, to shoot geese and to get them as food. So if a goose is wounded or is sick, two other geese will drop out of formation and will ferry the wounded or the sick goose down to ground. And they will wait there with that goose until it becomes well again or until it dies. They stay with it. When that happens, then the two geese will find either the next group or they will try and catch up with their original team of geese. Amazing. I love this. I love hearing the majesty of what God teaches. And I believe God speaks to us through everything. (laughs) His whole creation sings my great redeemer's praise. You could do a study on anything and God would speak to you through it. Because they've all got his fingerprints all over. There's a common creator, a common designer, and he wants to speak through us, to us through many ways. So what's the application of that to the church family? If we stay in unity and formation in our, within our families, within our life groups, within our campus, within our four campuses, we're far, able to achieve far more for the kingdom of God. We'll be able to share leadership roles so that people don't get burnt out and get exhausted. We'll be able to look after one another better. We'll be able to communicate better and know when someone isn't going well because we will sense it. In fact, there'll be a lot less flapping in our lives and a whole lot more gliding. People who share a common direction and sense of community get where they're going quicker and easier because they're travelling on the thrust of one another.
it's quite exciting being a part of this um, Arise conference that I'll be going to. Already I sense uh, the Holy Spirit uplift. <laughs> I feel the prayer for this conference. Every time I start praying, it's just like, Phoom! I feel like I'm hopping into a jet stream of something amazing that God is doing. That's the advantage of being part of others, part of the body of Christ. Our Egypt team are experiencing it right now. They are so working in formation at the moment. They have got jobs to do, set times, these to the orphanage, these ones building the shade sails. They are experiencing this uplift. They're, they're able to do far more as a team of 13 there than if you know one or two went by themselves. We have to be careful what we say when we honk from behind. We want to honk, <laughs> honk, honk, honk. We just have to be careful what we say and how we say it to that lead goose. You know what's a good thing to think about? When it's my turn to be up the front and everyone's behind me honking, how would I like them to honk? Honk, 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 honk. How would I like them to honk at me? That'll, that'll be a good measurement for us. Those who are heading in the same way as we are um, and stay in formation, create less drag and less opposition. There's a protection even in the realm of the spirit, of the opposition that we might normally face when we're actually surrounded by others. You see, Christianity is a team sport. As we stand beside each other, as we protect each other, we can see when someone's lagging and we can check in and we can pull them alongside. We can help them. The synergy of geese flying in formation is a picture of what happens when we fully realize the value of family and the value of unity and the value of being one together in our relationships, in our families, in our campuses, in our church, in our workplace, in our communities. So what's the origin of being one? Where's, where does unity come from? How do we become one? John seventeen twenty two says this, this is Jesus' prayer for us on the night before he died. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Glory. Do you know in the Old Testament, when it talks about glory, glory represented the presence of God. The presence of God that would appear as a pillar of fire at night and as a cloud by day that actually led the Israelites through the wilderness. That was called the glory of God. Now, the tabernacle was to contain the presence of God. And in the middle of the tabernacle, that was like the tent worship place that they had with them as they were traveling through the wilderness. In the center of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies was the golden Ark of the Covenant. And that was to contain the presence of God. And that's why only the high priest was allowed to go in once a year. That was the glory of God. That was the presence. And then the people were to be organized like this. The tabernacle was in the middle, but then on the north, on the south, on the east, on the west, were the 12 tribes of Israel. They had allotted places. Some had to be on the north, three tribes. Three tribes on the south, three tribes on the east, three tribes on the west. Each tribe facing the center where the tabernacle was, facing the presence of God. What held 12 tribes together that came from 12 unruly brothers? <laughs> what held them together? The glory of God. The presence of God in the middle. While they kept the presence of God in the center, they stayed together as the people of God, as the 12 tribes who followed God. Each one was a different tribe. Each one had a different banner, it says, that they had a different banner or standard that they walked under. And whenever um, God was ready to move and the, the pillar of fire would leave or the cloud would leave, Everyone would move in unison. They each knew what they had to carry and they moved as a unit, as a people of God to the next place that God was leading them to. God's presence was the pivot that held Israel together. Twelve different tribes, twelve different banners, one people of God. The presence of God in their midst held them together. So, that's Old Testament. 
What about the New Testament? What holds us together as the body of Christ today? Because we aren't literally camped around a tabernacle that's so ordered and organized there. The New Testament identifies Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, as the glory of God that came down. John 1.14, we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Jesus is the glory of God given to us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. Sorry, um, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. And God said, let light shine out of darkness. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us, is the glory of God in us. His Holy Spirit that he gave us. We still have the presence of God. We still have the glory of God with us. In fact, in a greater way because he's within each one of us. We don't have to sit around a tabernacle and watch for a cloud to move. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father are one triune God. Jesus does nothing on his own. He only speaks what the Father tells him. Jesus and the Father are one, and it's our relationship with Christ, who is the glory of God that links us in mind, in heart, in spirit, and purpose. Don't you love it when you just meet someone uh, uh, and you find out they're a Christian? Never met them before, and there's this... This connection, you guys had it when you were traveling overseas. I know Bill and Wendy experienced it. We've experienced it on mission. You just meet people and they're family because there's the one spirit, the one Jesus who lives in each one of us. We have one mind. We have one heart. We have one spirit. We have one purpose, even with people we have yet to meet. How amazing is that? The world is watching us. The world is watching What would happen if one of our campuses decided to head off in a separate direction? What if one of our pastors decided he had a different vision and was leading his campus off in another direction? What would the people in the Springfield community think about God if they looked at that? Being one multi-campus church with one vision, it's not about control. It's about following Jesus and keeping him at the center. We, the church, are like a living 3D picture book of Jesus and what God is like to unbelievers. If they see us squabbling and nitpicking, if they see us divisive and critical, they will not be interested in the God that we say we serve. But when they witness unity, when they see love, when they see grace extended, when they see speaking the truth in love, when they see people speaking well of one another, building each other up, honk, 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 honk. You can do it, you can do it. Then, just like the church in the book of Acts, we'll see our numbers being added to daily. So the basis for true Christian unity, it's not on externals, it's not our culture, it's not our skin colour, it's, it's not the way we do things. It's not our personality, our different characters, our, it's not even our gifts or our abilities. It's the glory of God in us. That's what makes us one. That's where unity... That means we can have a lot of diversity, we can have a lot of different people, a lot of different ways of doing life, but we can be one in Christ together. Our fellowship must be based on the essentials of our salvation in Jesus Christ. That's what makes us one. We already possess his glory. His spirit is within us. And as we grow in spirit, and we, as we have more of his spirit, as we have more of his glory, guess what the result is? You become more connected, more in unity with the believers around you. And I really keep saying this, <laughs> Because I think it bears saying, Holy Spirit's saying one thing. Holy Spirit's not leading, you know, saying this to Stuart and saying something completely different to Margaret and something completely other to Mark. 
Holy Spirit, when he's speaking, and he's speaking about his church, he is saying one thing, which is why we can be unified in God's goals for his church. We're all listening. He's going to say the same thing. That's all. Even the songs, Mike, thank you for the songs that you've picked for this morning's service, like, because I know where where the message is going, and all the songs are just lining up perfectly. Holy Spirit saying the one thing. He's packaging it in many different ways. We have every reason to love one another and live in unity in our marriages, our families, our campuses, our church, our community. We trust the same Savior. We share the same glory. We have the same spirit. We belong to the same Father and he seeks to do the same work. And that work is to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. And even now, that Egypt mission team is actually bringing a bit of heaven to a garbage village. That's what we're all called to do. We're called to bring heaven wherever we are. We're called to bring the presence of God wherever we are. And when we do, we will change things. We will make things better. We will make things brighter because God's plan to us bringing heaven here on earth is to pour his love, is to pour his grace into these people's lives so that they would come and know him. It's so that then people would see what God's really like and that they would be drawn to him. We can witness to the people in our lives simply through being his children and bringing his kingdom and showing his love. But when I try to protect myself or when I look to other people or I look to things as solutions for my problems, what's happening is I'm literally putting something else in the middle of my life. I'm putting that thing in the middle of my life. I'm putting that relationship in the middle of my life. I'm putting that that desire in the middle of my life or that problem even in the middle of my life. I'm displacing Jesus when these things consume me and control me. The solution at those times is to put Jesus back into the center of our lives. We have to go back to the origin of oneness, the origin of oneness, the glory of God, his Holy Spirit inside each one of us to protect our unity when we're having struggles. And just as Israel literally, like they literally built their lives... (laughs) with, Jesus, with the, the glory of God, the presence of God in the middle. They did it in a literal way. So we have to intentionally place Jesus in the middle of our relationships, place him in the middle of our families, in the middle of this campus, in the middle of our church. We remain one when we place Jesus, the glory of God, at the center of our hearts, the center of our lives, our relationships, our work, our play, our service in the kingdom of God. Placing Jesus, placing his character, placing his nature at the center of my problems and my struggles. And how do I do this? What does that look like? How do I put Jesus in the center? I use his name. I speak his name. His name contains every facet of his character, of his personality, of his nature. And when I use his name, I put him back into center position. And I can do that through song. That's what's so cool. That's why we come together and worship. It's not to let the band have a go. It's that we get together and we speak, we sing the name of Jesus. We proclaim Jesus over our life and our circumstances. When I place Jesus, who's perfect love, in the center of my life, fear is driven away. You know, perfect love drives out fear. Just speaking that scripture into my situation puts Jesus back in the center. When I place Jesus, who is good, in the center of my life, evil is defeated. When I place Jesus, who is peace, in the center of my life, storms get cast away and calmed. When I place Jesus, who is generous, and abundant in the center of my life, need and lack are cast away. When I place Jesus, who is the healer, in the center of my life, sickness gets consumed by his wholeness. When I place Jesus, who is Lord, in the center of my life, his plans prevail. My plans get pushed to the side. When I place Jesus who is the light of the world. I'm just giving you names of Jesus when I'm doing this. He's the light of the world. When I place him in the center of my life, what happens to darkness? 
It's gone. All I got to do is light one little candle and a room gets lit up. I put Jesus, the light of the world. And, and I can do that. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I can sing it. I can proclaim it. I can declare it. That's how I literally put Jesus back in the middle. When I place Jesus, who is forgiveness, at the center of my failures, my sins are forgiven. When I place Jesus, who is the reconciler, and I place him in the middle of a broken relationship, relationships will be reformed in the light of his glory and grace. When we place Jesus at the center of our relationships, things, the center of our desires, the center of other people, if we put other people in the center, then we'll be off course. When I put those things in, and they're the meditation of my heart, and they're the thing I'm consumed of, then I'll I'll be off course not only with God, but I'll be off course with everyone around me. Why do you have so many arguments and squabbles? (laughs) One of the scriptures said. Because your desire is for these things and not for Jesus. I just invite the worship team to come back up now, please. Three things we've covered this morning. The power of one. The early church were one in heart, one in mind, one in spirit, one in purpose. And they lived in community. And Jesus prayed, his prayer, his final prayer was that we would be one as he and the Father are one. That was his prayer. That, and why? So that the world would believe. Secondly, the origin of one. Our oneness is based on God's glory, on God's very presence. In the Old Testament, his very literal presence in the midst of 12 tribes. Today, Jesus lives in us by his spirit. We have his glory. We have his presence. We are able to live with him as center of our lives. We can live in community with God and we can live in community with each other, no matter how difficult the situation, because his power is above every other power. And Jesus at the center, by keeping Jesus, the glory of God, at the center of who we are and all we do, that's how we remain one. We do this by applying the name of Jesus, speaking the name of Jesus, singing the name of Jesus, declaring the name of Jesus, (laughs) proclaiming the name of Jesus in every circumstance. The power of family is the big umbrella for the next six weeks. And today's been the power of one, valuing our relationship with God, our marriages, our families, our life groups. Like I, I love that whole geese formation thing when I think about a life group I want to see each other providing updraft and lift less flapping a lot more gliding in our lives Jesus keeping him centre is crucial to the mission that he's given us we can't do it otherwise we cannot do it without him at the centre we are living 3D picture books of what being a follower of Jesus is Can I give you a strategy? I just want to finish with a a little strategy that um, helps me. If you're traveling somewhere and you are in unfamiliar territory and you're with um, another person and you're worried about getting lost, you even do this with your children if you go into the shops. If, If we get lost, we're going to meet back outside Target or If I'm in an unfamiliar place and there might be a a big square and there might be a pole, a flagpole, I will say, let's meet back at the flagpole. Well, if we get lost in some relationships, if we've lost our way maybe in a circumstance in our lives and we might be out of it, it's caused us to be out of relationships with some people, here's what we say. If you and I get lost, Tess, can you meet me at the cross? We'll find each other back at the cross. So if we've had a struggle in our relationship, all we have to do, where's Tess? I'm disconnected. Something's wrong. If I wait here (laughs) and we have an agreement between us that we will meet back at the cross and she comes while we stand here, whatever that issue was between us, And if I stand here and I imagine Jesus who hung on that cross and I imagine his blood falling down, 
dripping on my hands, dripping on my feet. Guess what happens about the issue that was between us? It just flattens. The things that bothered no longer bother us when we can meet each other at the foot of the cross because that is the place of unity. That is the place of agreement. And I can say that any area where we're struggling in, we've probably not got Jesus in the center of it. He might be off center. We might just have to place him back in the center at the foot of the cross. I think that's something we should, as a church family, adopt. Meet you at the cross. You know, sometimes we go, oh, let's do coffee. And that means we want to maybe have a serious conversation with someone. Maybe we say, let's meet at the cross. Because Jesus makes us one. And if we can't agree on anything else, what can we agree on? The completed work of Jesus Christ. Forgiving me for my sins. Forgiving you for your sins. We're forgiven. Is there anything left to hang on to? No. Let's meet at the cross. Let's put him back at the center.